for those who understand philosophy. That is the annihilist's logic. And um, I have been greatly influenced in my research and study over the last few years about the philosophers of the 19th century and how after they, in the early 20th century, to be truthful as well, after they concluded everything about this new way of thinking, about there is no need for God, how they conclude a terrible, terrible, empty conclusion that everything is pointless. Pointless. Solomon is going to be one of our focuses today. I'm going to hopefully challenge the way you view him. He certainly has challenged me recently. I want to study his life again and study some of his philosophy. But then I want us to turn our eyes upon a better way. He was falsely arrested, illegally charged for an offence he never committed, dragged brutally from his friends by military personnel. He was bashed up and verbally abused. He was embarrassed, and they tried to force him into a false confession. He was beaten nearly to death, flesh ripped from his body. He was executed in a violent way and accepted it all with a forgiving attitude. He endured what all of us would dread and did so with honour and integrity. And why did this Lord of ours allow such a thing to happen to him? Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Who for the joy. Joy was central to all that Jesus did. When you reflect over his life, he certainly had something going for him. Let's not confuse the real meaning of joy with an emotional state of happiness. Remember in the garden where he anguished and suffered? Remember that terrible moment? Here he struggled with the horror and terror before him, and then proclaiming, Not my will, Father, but yours. Yours be done. I don't suppose that happiness was high on his emotional map at that moment. But a deep sense of knowing that this was the right course promised a deep joy that would help him to hold his cause. Jesus endured everything in the Passion Week for the joy that was set before him. Joy! His focus was a deep sense of joy, not fear-driven or dutiful religious motivation. Joy. To him, there was a sacred, deep, and inspiring joy behind everything he did, even the pain of the cross. There appears to be something pretty powerful about the motivation Jesus found in his understanding of joy. I mean, suffering at the hands of his enemies, being ridiculed by his people, rejected by his friends, and then becoming a sin offering for his broken creation? Wow! As I reflect over this, the modern pursuit of happiness and self-centered fulfillment would never have led him to the cross. But joy did. The modern pursuit of happiness and selfish desires would never have taken there. But then if we really had a good definition of joy, maybe we would see what he saw and be more motivated in ourselves. Joy. It's taking me a while to crack this one because and when you look at the English definition of joy, it's pretty weak. And so I spent a bit of time in the Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek trying to get my head around how Jesus would have seen the word, especially as a Jew. Remember that little verse that says, The joy of the Lord is my strength? You see, right now I'm wishing I brought the whiteboard down. I am going to say it. <laughs> There's a wonderful picture, and I'll describe the picture of the Aramaic word for you so you get where it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That word joy, 
It's unlike some of the other words that we interpret into joy. I want you to imagine a picture of a tent. One of those old-fashioned tents they used to have. Or if you have your mind and, and, and you remember seeing a documentary, one of those nomad tents, the round ones, pretty closed off. But I want you to imagine there's a door in that tent, a flap, because it's not a door as you and I know, it's a flap. And I want you to imagine that flap is spilled over top so that you can see out of the tent into the world outside. you get the idea? If I were to draw the Aramaic word, that is what you'd see for the word unity. The root word for the joy of the Lord is the word to be united or unity. Where the outside and the inside spill together. Do you see that? That's the Aramaic word for unity. And then they add one more letter or one more picture to complete it, to turn it to the word joy. And it's this one. It's the man with the upheld hand, and it means to be exhilarated. So, joy is the picture of you walking from the inside, outside to the inside, feeling unity and peace and going, wow, I am here. Pretty cool picture, eh? For the Aramaic word for the joy of the Lord is my strength. So behind that word joy, you have a unity with God and the exhilaration of it being connected. Pretty cool, eh? I am in God and He loves me. Woo! That's the picture, by the way. So that's one of the reasons I love studying Aramaic, because it's a picture language, not a technical language like the Greek. And we're going to look at the Greek soon. So now I'm giving you that picture. Joy. Joy is the result of a deep thirst quenched and the exhilaration that this brings is the best definition I can give you of joy. Joy is the result of a deep thirst quenched and the exhilaration that this brings. Beautiful words, eh? Jesus had a deep thirst within him. Yes, he did. Believe it or not, he had a deep thirst. A bit different from ours, but he had a deep thirst. A deep purpose and soul demand that drove everything he did. And what was that purpose? His focus and the bones that held his flesh to his life? Well, it tells us he had a desire, a joy, to sit down at the right-hand side of God. There are two ideas caught in this. The idea that he sat down is the image of completing your labor. I've done what I said I will do. <sighs> I can rest here. For those who, like me, have worked on the farm and you've been shearing for, you know, 10 hours, your back's sore and you've just finished whatever number of sheep you've just finished with and you look back and the pens are empty and the boss says, ah, time to sit down. You know that feeling well. Ah, <sighs> it's done. You sit down in the Aramaic imagery when you've completed the task you've been called to do. Get it? He sat down, he completed what he was called to do on the right hand side of God, and this is a beautiful image, the right hand side of anyone is a place of honor and glory. He sat there with the Father, well pleased with him. He made Dad proud and pleased. For the joy set before him, for the exhilaration and the deep desire to fulfill the purpose of God in his life. He endured the cross, despising his shame, and completed what he was sent to do, and was well pleased, was enjoying, sorry, the pleasure and glory of the Father for doing it. Good image, eh? Joy is something profound and focused. It is a product of purpose and a sense of accomplishment. Paul, when teaching the church of Galatia, said that if we reject self-centered living and small-minded pleasure, what he calls the flesh. For a more profound thing, walking in the spirit, we will produce in our lives qualities that are profitable for our well-being and eternal enjoyment. 
What the flesh pursues in bad living and sinful behaviour, the spirit delivers through maturity and transformation. Later on in Galatians 6, Paul concludes that pursuing happiness in the shallow offerings of sinful living will produce an eternal separation from God. Well, that makes sense. After all, if you want to live your life separated from God now, from God now, why wouldn't he give you what you want for eternity? God only gives you what you desire in this life. And if you don't want to live with God now, be free not to live with him in eternity. But it's just not a good place. Whereas pursuit of a deep, meaningful sense of living in Christ will always lead to an outgrowth of abundant, meaningful, transformational living now and forever. When we refer to Christian joy, therefore, what we're meaning is a real connection of the Spirit within our souls, within our being, with God. An exhilaration of this floods our lives. Floods it. This deep realization that God has sent His Spirit into our hearts, that Spirit calls out, Abba, Daddy, Father. And in that unity, oh, I am exhilarated. <laughs> so what does joy mean when Paul says it using the Greek language? That's what you'd see if you read the Greek up top there in the read. Odi karpos tau numatos istin agape kara. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Karpos, the idea of plucking the fruit is caught here, but it's only the idea. The literal definition is the effect, the result, the advantage, the produce and profit of something. So the fruit of the Spirit. It is the effect, the result, the advantage, and the production and profit of the Spirit. Interesting, eh? And the word kara, this is the word we interpret as joy. The root word here means to be rejoicing and be glad. A sense of being well or complete, a thriving due to the sense of satisfaction in something. That's pretty deep, don't you think? So the fruit or what the production or the effect or the advantage or what the Spirit profits us when we're walking in Him and living with Him is a sense of rejoicing, a gladness for all He has done, a sense of being well or complete with inside us, a thriving due to the sense that we know God loves us, He loves us so much, He sent His Son and we are his children, and in that I thrive. Certainly a better definition than happiness, isn't it? Interesting that the word kara is also linked to the word charis, where we get the word grace from. Grace and joy are the same concept. With the definition hopefully cleared up a bit more, a deep sense of satisfaction and exhilaration that is based upon God, His work in our lives, and our sense of, wow, we are so blessed. With that in mind, is your faith vital and real to the point of you living it out with a deeper and deeper sense of gladness for all God has done for you, through you, and for you? Or is your life defined by something different? Are you, like our Lord, driven by a deep sense of joy? Or is it something else? Love my fruit? Have you clipped to it yet? That's good, eh? Is your life more defined by small thinking about the immediate and therefore sad when things don't go your way? Are you miserable and hard-hearted? Bitter at people for not being what you demand them to be. Pursuing physical pleasure to satisfy the deep emptiness within. You can only produce in your life what your heart, soul and mind are full of. And if you're full of these things, you will never experience the exhilaration and satisfaction of knowing God and enjoying His love deeply. 
These are the things of the flesh that Paul talks of in Galatians. Hatred, anger, bitterness. Those are not the fruit, the product, the benefit of God's Spirit. Joy, therefore, if it's linked to rejoicing and all these other terms, doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not some sort of magic wand thing there, all of a sudden you know, I'm full of joy. That's not joy. Joy is a consequence. It is a result of something. Joy in Christ is a result of all He has done for us. It is a life that continually strives to be in awe of all Jesus is to us and all God thinks about us. It is the fruit, the product, the profit, if you like, of knowing and really knowing God loves us and really understanding He sent His Son to die for us, for our benefit. Maybe that is why the first produce or fruit or outworking of the spirits is in fact love followed by joy for it is the supreme fruit from which all others flow I love God he madly loves me I know he loves me that floods my soul I am satisfied and exhilarated by such knowledge <clears throat> to know I am loved by God, to sense the acceptance He has for me, and to know He holds me eternally in His caring hands. This results in a deep appreciation that flows through my whole life. It goes through me and out of me into other people's lives, because how could such joy be boxed up? This gladness and deep sense of appreciation affects every moment. It reminds me that every second is sacred, and it's a great gift from God. Joy is the natural fruit of a meaningful life. After all, if you are walking in the Spirit, your life should have meaning. It is the result of knowing who I am in God and who He is to me. Joy is the first fruit which births out from it worship and celebration. If you are not able to worship God, then it is probable you are not fully aware of all God is and how good He's been to you and for us. What is the opposite to this joy? Remember me saying joy is the result of a deep thirst quench and the exhilaration that it brings? Joy is the deepest sense of knowing God and enjoying Him and all He has done for us and allowing this to be the inspiration and focus of our life. And it's sense of satisfaction that comes from knowing Jesus and the Holy Spirit working in us, it just wells up. The opposite, therefore, the opposite, therefore, must be a deep sense of emptiness that leaves us craving for something that never satisfies us. This then leads to us realizing everything is pointless and meaningless. Don't jump ahead. That's it. We'll come to Solomon soon. I wrote this poem reflecting over my days. I spent a good chunk of my life miserable, bitter, angry, disillusioned, and full of so many crappy things. So much so that for those who I've said this before, I ended up being locked in psych ward. I had electric shock therapy. I've been on so many drugs. It's amazing. I'm, it's just rubbish. At the end of it, I had a very meaningful encounter with God who really did turn my life around and I was reflecting on that. And I wrote this poem yesterday. When the sunlight feels cold on the skin, the gentle breeze reminds me of the storm, the birds singing a curse of nature to the soul, and the touch from a loved one distant from all the senses, where all joy is cold and warm, and grief and sorrow my daily chore where the grave seems like a bed of comfort, and each breath the reminder of life's turmoil and curse, when all life offers is seen clearly as futile and vain, one seeks a balm for inner pain. That, to me, is the opposite of what I have now. That was my crack. I remember, and I'm not going to go into it long, but I remember one period of time when I'd been in mental health care because I'd become very suicidal. I remember my mum come and stayed with us 
and in Clayton Road, and the house that we had there, and I would wake up, and it was called that, in the mental ward, we used to have a thing called the haunted hour. You may have heard that expression. It's between three and four o'clock in the morning. For whatever reason, people with major depression seem to wake up at a particular time, very close together. And we, we used to joke about, oh, you had one of those nights. Yeah. Yeah, what time? Or between, well, it's actually between two and four. Yeah. I know being here. You know, I remember sitting in the darkness, just wishing it would swallow me up. And I remember wondering why I was breathing. I concluded that life is vain, worthless, pointless, hopeless, miserable, and it gutted me. So I have experienced the opposite of joy, so much so that I had to be locked away for my own benefit. I get gloom. I get pain. I get the desire to cease to exist. I remember the time cursing God for my birth. So I know the opposite of joy. Solomon, the wisest of all the ancient kings of Israel, was not necessarily the gladdest or, or, or happiest or joyful person if you study his life. He really wasn't that happy, nor was he very joyful. He lived a long life for his day, and at the end of it, he wrote a humble report of everything that he had concluded in Ecclesiastes. The reading I did earlier is Ecclesiastes 2, for you if you want to reflect over it. Right from the start of this book, we get this real sense that he wanted to try everything life had to offer. He had all he could. And after looking back, he concluded that life for him wasn't very good. In fact, the summary of his pursuit came down to this meaningless of chasing after the wind. And boy, do I remember those feelings. I listed all that Solomon did to try and get my head around exactly how he tried to fill his misery. <clears throat> These, by the way, are the conclusions from um, Ian Ecclesiastes 2, and also if you read his life, you'll get a list. And listen to his list. He partied and drank a lot. He gained status and glory in the eyes of powerful people. He lived in luxury and splendor. He had in industries built around his wants and happiness. Having industries built around your wants and needs. Watch out, Microsoft, mine are all IT. <laughs> he had power over people's lives. A slave owner. He ran successful enterprises and gained wealth. His money and wealth was beyond measure and allowed him to have whatever his eyes saw and wanted. He was sexually active and had many sexual partners. Influence over others and other nations were his. He was a glutton and a hedonist. Does that disturb you to hear that? By the way, he did. You read that carefully and break it down. That's what he claimed to be. <coughs> All is meaningless, empty-handed, and pointless was his conclusion of that lifestyle. <laughs> Solomon may well have been uh, considered wise, but not very godly. But it was not able to give him a deep satisfaction resulting in exhilaration. All he discovered was that after a while it will become one great big event of nothing. So imagine, one great big event of nothingness. Or, let's read his word. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labours, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. A life that pursues merely the pleasure of the immediate is fickle. It's a fickle thing and finds itself before God empty and deserving of its own fruit. Emptiness and worthlessness and eventually separation from God eternally. We always inherit the fruit of our lives when we face eternity. Kakuli and many other people of the nihilist movement, when they said they had removed God out of the picture, their conclusion was madness. A futility and pointlessness, emptiness and living grave within inside their souls. 
Without God, life is pointless. So now we have looked at the opposite of joy. Joy, the fruit of living well in Christ. C.S. Lewis had an understanding of joy that went like this. A deep-seated longing that is embedded in us that is questing for its proper object. In other words, there is a deep sense need inside of us that remains driving us, a deep-seated need that we have a hunger that we pursue all our lives to feel good or whatever. But joy is the result when you collide with the real reason you're meant to be, to know God and to enjoy Him forever. C.S. Lewis, a deep-seated longing that is embedded in us, that is questing for its proper object. There exists in us a desire, hunger, and hope that life might be valuable, meaningful, and full of joy. We are existential creatures. We need reason. We need purpose. We need to sense our satisfaction in why I'm breathing. That's what existentialistic means. We're existential creatures. There is a demand in us to have meaning and purpose. And our souls become weighed down if we are found boxed in by futility. And our souls become boxed in if we find ourselves boxed in, weighed down, sorry, if we find ourselves boxed in by futility. C.S. Lewis is correct. Deep sense of joy can only come when our hunger is met. And that can only come when we know God. Enjoy God and understand the eternal purposes God has for us. Joy is an indicator that one has tasted and seen that the Lord is good and pleasant for our souls. To have encountered the immense love God has for us will trigger a sense of exhilaration and satisfaction. This world cannot steal from us. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Do you see how that links now? If joy is a fruit, a product, a profitability, or a result of being in life in the spirit, what is the substance of this fruit? Well, for me, I found six substances that, that joy has brought into my life. Consistent living. I'm not double-minded. More and more, I am happy to think about the things of God. Growing knowledge of God and who He is to me. To know who this God is, is big deal. Wow. Reflective living. I'm aware of God moving in and about us. Profound living, God is doing something and wants us to be a part of it. Right living, I don't need garbage to fill my soul. Good living is great and satisfying. I don't need to get topped over with drink and drugs. I'm happier. My life is full of joy. Whereas many people doing that still remain empty. Fellowship living, I love what God is doing and others too and celebrate with them. Eternity aware and centered death has lost its thing and everything has eternal value and relevance. All that produces a sense of exhilaration and satisfaction in me. And I am full of joy. And what produces this fruit? Well, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And how does he do it? Well, through his purposes, his ministry, what he's all about. And what is his ministry and work about? Well, as stated a few weeks ago when we looked at Genesis 2, and Genesis 1, sorry, Genesis 1, what is the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit? He takes us from chaos to order. He takes us from death to life. He takes us from being emptied to being filled he transforms us into a people who flourish and enjoy the things of God and His grace. He is ultimately transforming us into the people He called us to be, followers of Jesus Christ. He Himself being the first fruit among many brothers and sisters. We're on His path. 
I know that there are many people who don't know this joy, people who come week in and week out seeking their soul's fulfillment. Let's not pretend all is well with God's garden. Weeds can take hold and pests can ravage the crop. There is no magic to this joy, no simple imaginary gift given. No, such joy is a result of living well in Jesus. It is as a fruit, not a gift. Notice the difference. Gifts are given for the benefit and they are miraculous. Fruit is a byproduct of living in Christ. It is a consequence, something that shows we are living correctly. Jesus once said, by their free fruit you shall know them. And where God's people are depressed, where bitterness rules and people play games to look for part, this is not the ground where the fruit can flourish. A good crop, a good crop of fruit does not come from an unhealthy tree. The tree must be healed before it is fruitful again. And such healing comes only for a soul that is willing to pursue the quest to know God and enjoy Him forever. Such a person refuses the superficials. They are pursuing exhilaration and satisfaction in what really matters, life in Christ. While eyes are on this world and all its pursuit for happiness, Solomon's conclusion will grip our souls. We will discover everything is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Such a person, such a person will only find sadness rotting their souls. But, when eyes are lifted and hearts renewed, when we find all the good things God has done for us, when we appreciate deeply everything it took, ah, what joy fills our minds and hearts. Only a life well lived, healthy in its thinking, pursuing a real life as Jesus called us to, Love and focused on the Creator can enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. <coughs> and this fruit of joy is most certainly a product of real faith focused on what really matters. Joy is a fruit that is focused on what really matters. Life in Christ. A lot of thoughts narrating. But you know, thinking about Solomon, all those years to roll up your life in futility. That's not what God sent Jesus for. He said, I have come that you may have life in all its abundance. That stuff by allowing God into your life and accepting everything He's done for us. God is good all the time. And I want to leave you with those thoughts tonight. Today. I want you to consider are you living a life marked by joy? satisfaction and exhilaration about all that God has done for you. But if you're telling me your life is empty, purposeless, and you're discovering that that isn't part of your life, well, it's easy. It's change. God's Spirit is about transformation. Stop. Turn. Grow in Christ. We're going to close with a blessing. I'm going to get you, because I haven't done it for a while. I'm going to do what I love doing. Let's grab hands across and connect together in unity. By the way, if you ever want...